Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we uh, studied First Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter one. We'll continue on with uh, uh, chapter two. Just give me a second, please. Okay, so we'll continue on with um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Before that, we will just uh, look at what Asha has mentioned as her takeaway. Uh, she says, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9, when we are saved, we are called to a holy living and to fulfill what God has ordained for us. Uh, we should walk in faith and love and hold on to them so that we won't be proud or bring self uh, superiority, live in a state of self-superiority, and we should also hold on to the truth. Okay, thank you, uh, Asha. I think this was a good uh, uh, summary of um, exactly what, uh, you know, Paul is trying to communicate in uh, Second Timothy chapter 1. Okay, anyone else has anything uh, to share or ask or, you know, point out in First Tim Second Timothy chapter 1? Okay, if not, we'll move on to um, chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. Okay, so can one of you please read uh, verse 1, please? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. So here uh, he says, you know, uh, be empowered by the grace in Christ uh, Jesus. Now, Paul talks about, uh, you know, in his other epistles, he asks uh, or he writes to the various churches to be strong in other things. Uh, but we see in Ephesians chapter 6, where he tells uh, the church at Ephesus to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, okay? We know that uh, uh, God is a source of power uh, and strength, and we can use his power and strength to live our lives. So there he's saying, you know, he's writing the church at Ephesus in, in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his um, might. But here, uh, in um, Second Timothy chapter two, he's saying, you know, "Be strong in the grace." Okay, who is the source of grace? It's God who is the source of grace. Uh, you know, God has bestowed His grace uh, on you and me. And uh, as we read in Ephesians chapter two, that God has lavished all grace upon us. God has lavished His grace. Uh, which talks about the abundance of his grace in our lives. He's lavished his grace upon us. So he is the source of grace. He is the one who bestows uh, grace on our lives. So when Paul is saying, be strong in the grace of God that is given to us in Christ, he's basically saying, you know, be established in the grace that God has bestowed upon us or given uh, to us. So what does that mean? you know, be established in the grace or be strong in the grace. It means that don't let anyone or anything, you know, shake you from the fact that God is a God of grace and his grace has been extended to um, to you and abundance uh, of his grace or his riches of his grace has been extended uh, to us, you know. Uh, why is it important for us to... Um, hold on to this fact because you know the devil is very very uh, good at getting us out of the place of grace so he gets us uh, in areas of our life he can get us uh, to move from an area of or a place of grace uh, to give more importance to works uh, so that can, you know, subtly very uh, you know he can very um, uh, smartly just very uh, you know 
uh, in a connived way, just bring this into our life where he can move us from a place of grace to give importance to work. So we begin to think that, you know, I have to do this, this, this to, uh, to if I need to receive blessings from God, if I need to receive his protection, his love, his favor, his goodness. And so we can get out of that place of grace into works where we begin to think that, you know, uh, maybe I need to read three chapters a day from the Bible or I have to pray one hour or, you know, I have to fast at least once a week or, you know, I have to attend church, I have to take Holy Communion um, or I have to give so much of money to for charity. Uh, when I do all of these things, you know, God is good. He'll, uh, uh, sorry, he'll be happy, he'll be pleased and then I will inherit his favor, his mercy, his goodness and his uh, blessings. Yes, it's important uh, to do works, but uh, you know, works uh, is uh, not to do, we don't do the works to earn uh, God's blessing, his favor, uh, his mercy upon our lives, but we do the works because we have received an abundance of his grace. So our works is a result of, uh, you know, because we have received the abundance of grace or His grace that has been lavished upon us, that results in the work that we do for uh, God. So we do it out of a joyful heart, out of a heart that is, uh, you know, uh, to bless Him through our works. Uh, and we can say, you know, uh, when we do these works, we're saying, God, you know, I'm giving you everything because you have given me everything and I want you have given me your best you have sent your only son you know and you have given me uh you know gift of righteousness you have justified me you have sanctified me you made me holy uh you have given me eternal life and because of what you have done I am willing to surrender I am willing to give everything and I'm doing everything because uh, you know, you have blessed me because I'm so grateful and thankful. And you're doing it out of a sense of love and uh, joy and gratefulness and thankfulness. And that is when our works will bear fruit. That is when our works will edify us as well. That is when our works uh, will um, enrich us and you know we will see a greater purpose and meaning in what god has called us to do and even when we face challenges we will not run away from pursuing god's call and purpose and doing what he has asked us to do the works that he has asked us to do because uh you know we're doing it out of deep commitment deep love faithfulness because of who God is to us, what he has done for us, what he's lavished upon us, what we have received from him, you know, and we do that uh, because we are so grateful and so uh, thankful. Another area which the devil can get us out of a place of grace uh, is in the area of guilt and condemnation. You know, we know that God has uh, lavished us with divine favor. Uh, he sees us as his sons, his daughters, as his beloved. But, you know, the, the, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He's always accusing us. So he draws us out of a place of uh, grace. So that is why Paul is saying, you know, telling Timothy, be strong in that grace. Because, um, you know, when you go through uh, your, uh, 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 the challenges, um, you know, sometimes you will begin to do all these works because you want to earn favor from God, but don't do that you know do it out of a sense of joy commitment uh, gratefulness and thankfulness and also you will face a lot of guilt and condemnation because of what people are talking people will say things you will hear things uh, but you know uh, don't uh, move away from that place of grace uh, because we know that we have studied in the new testament that grace uh, is also empowering uh, you know, it empowers us and we've already seen how it empowers us here in uh, in 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 this, uh, the first chapter, verse 9, he says, you know, uh, God who has called us, uh, who has saved us and called us with the calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is given us in Christ Jesus before time began. So, you know, God has called us, he's given us a purpose, but he's given us a grace to enable us to fulfill that calling and purpose. So, you know, grace in the New Testament just does not mean divine favor, but it also means divine empowering. 
and divine enablement, like we've seen in verse 9 of chapter 1 in 2 Timothy. Uh, okay, so uh, God's grace empowers us. It makes us strong. It gives us favor. So he's telling Timothy, draw strength from his uh, grace. Yes, the devil will make you feel inadequate uh, to the point that, you know, sometimes we feel so inadequate that we won't do anything. Yes, we will feel inadequate. There are times when we will feel inadequate. Sometimes we feel the task is too daunting. It's too big. It's too great. Uh, but at that time, what do we do? We rely on the grace of God because the grace of God uh, empowers us. Uh, it and I know that I can do this, what God has called me to do, even though I feel uh, inadequate, insufficient for that, or I feel it's too great or too big. Uh, but I know that I can go forward doing this because God's grace is upon me. I can still work on me because his grace will undergird us. His grace will undertake for all of our limitations, for all of our inadequacies, um, and when we are firm in the grace of God, you know, we will not shy away from the challenges and the greatness of the task, but we will just go ahead uh, because we know that his grace will undertake for us. So we just need to go ahead, take on the task. The enemy will make us feel inadequate. Uh, we will try to shy away from the task. We will try to leave the call or the assignment that God has for us. But always know that, you know, when we stand firm in the grace of God, that, you know, uh, he will enable us to do what he has called us to do, fulfill what he has called us to do, uh, because uh, the grace of God gives us the divine enablement, the divine empowerment, and the divine uh, favor. Okay, so whatever you are facing in life in the present season, uh, you feel that it's too much, it's too big, you're not, uh, you feel inadequate, uh, uh, you feel it's very difficult, challenging, but just know that, you know, uh, God is empowering you with His grace. And His grace is more than sufficient. That is why Paul says, right? Um, um, uh, His grace is more than sufficient. Uh, for everything that I'm going through. Uh, and God tells him, my grace is more than sufficient uh, for you. And Paul also has experienced that um, um, in your times of difficulties and times of hardship. So his grace is more than sufficient for us to any season and every season and whatever challenge that we face or whatever task that lies ahead of us, even though it's big, know that his grace is more than sufficient for you. Uh, and stand in that grace of God. Okay. Uh, verse 2, can one of you please read verse 2, please? Uh, verse 2. Yes, go ahead, Charles. Okay, verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So now Paul is charging Timothy, you know, to pass on what he has received, the truths, the revelation, the doctrines to the succeeding generations. He says, you know, the truth has to be taught at any cost, Timothy. And he says, this is something that, uh, you know, also all of us uh, must do. You know, um, we need to ask ourselves, you know, what are we doing with God, what God has put into our lives? What are we doing with all of uh, the truths that we have been, you have been learning in Bible college or you've been learning in the past uh, years of your life? You know, what have you been doing with all that you've received from God? Um, all of the experiences that you've had with uh, with God, your encounters with God, the, the revelations that you have received, the truth that you have received, what are you doing uh, with it? Are you passing it on uh, to someone else? So it's important that we pass on our experiences, our encounters, the truth that we are learning. We teach it, we pass it on to the younger generations, whether it's children, youth, your own uh, family members, older people, you know, passing it on, uh, helping them to uh, you know, live the truth, encounter the truth, and experience God as you have experienced and you are experiencing Him. Okay. And then he goes on to give um, uh, three analogies. 
before we look at these three analogies, I want you to think about you know just these questions that I've just asked. What are you doing with what God has put into your hands? Are you just acquiring all of this knowledge just for yourself, uh, so that you go strong in the Lord in your faith, which is good, you know? But are you using it to share it with others? So if you are not, uh, why aren't you? Or you know, if you uh, have received everything, then why aren't you sharing? What is holding you back? You know, don't wait for when you're going to finish or your three years of studies in Bible college and then go and share it. What can you do now in this season, in this point in your life, in this week? You know, how can you share these truths uh, with others, teach it to others, or just impart it to uh, uh, to the uh, to generations that are going to follow? Uh, how What are you doing? Because God is going to hold us accountable uh, for what we have received, uh, what we've experienced of him. And, you know, he's going to hold us accountable if you're going to share it uh, with others because, you know, he wants us to do uh, that just like we uh, see in the Old Testament. Okay, we'll move on to verses 3 to 7 where he presents three analogies. And through these three analogies, he's basically, uh, you know, uh, encouraging Timothy to... Um, how to face hardships and how to uh, live a life as uh, a minister of God. So can one of you please read verses 3 to 7, please? Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Amen. Thank you, Say. So here through the uh, three analogies of a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer, you know, Paul is um, uh, highlighting a few characteristics for Timothy on how to be a good minister of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, or, you know, how to be a good minister of the gospel that has been entrusted to him. So the first thing he says, you know, as a soldier, you need to endure hardships because a soldier you know, uh, uh, endures hardship, goes through difficulties and challenges, but endures through. And he's saying, you know, being a man of God, uh, serving, uh, being in ministry, in the position that you are, it's not easy, but you need to endure hardship as a good soldier. Okay. And he's saying that, you know, um, as a leader in that position that he is in, in Ephesus, he's like a soldier you know, and he must serve God. He must not look for a life of ease or comfort, but be ready to go through hardships and uh, difficulties. And, you know, a soldier is always um, ready for the call of duty. Uh, you know, he might be taking care of his family, but he's not so caught up uh, in all of that. You know, when uh, there is a call for duty, he responds. Uh, he's willing to even give up on his family, his children, his spouse, and just respond to the call of duty. Uh, and he says, you know, a soldier never gets entangled with the affairs of this life. He is always wanting to please his commanding officer, like we studied in, in the book of Romans when Paul writes to the church at Rome, you know, and uh, uh, he's always there ready for the call of duty any any time of the day, any season in life. And he says, he's telling Timothy, you know, live that way, be ready to do what God is calling you to do uh, uh, at any point of um, time. But having said this, it does not mean that, you know, um, uh, as, a, as a man of God who's serving God, who is fulfilling the call and the purpose of God, that we don't take on or fulfill the responsibilities towards our own family or our parents, our spouse, our children. Uh, yes, we do that. God will enable us to do that as well. But what it says is that we must be ready uh, to do God's call. It means that we don't make any compromises when God calls us, that we don't... Uh, you know, compromise or we don't 
take on the call or we don't pursue the call although we don't make an excuse because of our family or our spouse or our children or because just, we're just married or we just had a child you know uh, or our children are growing uh, we don't make those excuses but we are willing to uh, you know pursue the call at any cost uh, just like a soldier would uh, do and we would not get entangled in uh, you know the earthly affairs or uh, things that are not eternal pursuing that you know but we would keep ourselves free to do what God has called us because sometimes we can get so entangled with the things of this world um, you know uh, with our own uh, life assignments in terms of our our chores or our jobs or you know a profession or our studies or whatever you know and we're willing to pursue that uh, you know at the cost of the call of God upon our life so for example you know if God is calling us to go uh, as a missionary or as a pastor or as a you know evangelist um, and minister maybe in our own the place that we are staying in or to another country another city but we just make an excuse saying that you know um, uh, we can make an excuse uh, saying that you know God I just I don't feel quite equipped. I want to just, I just finished my three years in Bible college. I want to do my master's. I want to do my PhD. Uh, but, you know, uh, God is calling you to do, you know, pursue his call. But here you are more academic oriented, intellectual oriented. You want to get degrees. You want to get more uh, uh, education. Or maybe he's asking you to be a pastor and you're saying, no, I want, you know, or, you, he's asking you to work among children you say no I want to be a counselor you know whatever excuse that you can give uh, or you want to get married you don't want to move to another city because you're just married you've had children uh, or studying and things like that but you know uh, we need to just keep ourselves free to do what God has called us to do the second analogy he gives is that of an athlete um, you know an athlete um, uh, can prepare well can practice well uh, can do everything that is needed to you know uh, to be a good athlete to run that race but an athlete cannot win that race unless the athlete competes by the rules uh, of that of the of the game of the race you know so what are some of the rules that an athlete has to um, you know um, uh, compete under it's you know when the uh, only run when the whistle is blown or, or when they hear the gunshot or keep to your lane and you also have to finish the race you have to uh, run across the finishing uh, line and that's when you're qualified uh, to win the race if you don't compete by the rules then you can't even though you run the race you know uh, you cannot win because you have not uh, you know follow the rules you're not competed by the rules so also you know when we serve God uh, we don't serve in our own terms what uh, you know uh, benefits us what seems comfortable for us what seems easy for us but we need to meet his requirements we need to meet his standards which which means we need to do we need to order our lives that are holy pleasing acceptable in his sight you know maintain that sense of holiness moral purity the way we um, our actions uh, our thoughts our private life uh, what is in secret and what is in open should be holy and pleasing to god um, not just put on uh, a mask of holiness but you know living lives that are sinful because god's word says your sin will find you out you know uh, and also you know doing his will otherwise you know like jesus said uh many will say to me you know uh, uh you know i have gone to the prison i have fed the poor i've taken uh you know care of the prisoners but you know uh jesus god will say i do not know who you are you know why because in that context basically 
God is saying, because you did not do my will. You did what you felt comfortable. You felt what you wanted to do, but you did not pursue my will, my call, my purpose uh, for your life. So it's important that we serve God in his terms and do what he is calling us to do, what he's purpose us to do. And I remember, you know, uh, at one point of time when I just wanted to leave a ministry assignment, uh, God um, took me through a week of... Um, uh, you know, through his word, teaching me who really is a missionary, what's the calling, and basically through Paul's epistles and through his life. And uh, at the end of the week, I said, okay, God, I'm going to go back and do what you called me to do, what you purpose for me to do in that place. So I went back, and in, in a day's time, you know, I was put off with things again, and then I came back and I, I told God, you know, I'm not going back. Uh, I don't think this is the place where I need to continue on and minister. And there's something that God, you know, very powerfully spoke to me. He said, you know, ministry is not a matter of convenience, but it's a command. Okay, ministry is not a matter of convenience, but it's a command. And so my command is go back, do it, uh, you know, do it till I tell, uh, I open the doors uh, for you in another place and I shut this door. And, you know, I, I went back. I did it. Uh, I, I continued ministering there. And in a very God honoring way, you know, God opened uh, doors for me in another place and shut the door for me here. And I was able to exit in a very God honoring way, in a very nice way, and enter into the next place that God had uh, for me. So God knows, He sees our challenges, our struggles, but uh, He will provide a way out. He will give us the grace um, that we need. Uh, to continue on and when we need to leave, when we need to stop, when we need to exit, when we need to walk into another door. But all we need to do is just, uh, you know, not look for um, our own convenience, but, you know, just follow his command, be obedient, submissive. He knows everything and he will just uh, enable us and strengthen us and help us. So we need to compete by the rules, you know, by God's standards, uh, live, the standards do what he wants us to do in the way that he wants us to do live by that do his will uh, in complete obedience and submission and that is what jesus did even when he pursued uh, god's call and his will for his life uh, even as he became uh, you know he came down on this earth and he walked on this earth and the third analogy is that of a farmer now a farmer uh, you know uh, has a plot of land, but he cannot enjoy or reap a harvest unless he, you know, he works hard tilling it and, you know, uh, you know, sowing the seeds, taking care of it, uh, you know, watering it, putting the right pesticides, you know, caring for it. It's hard work. It's hard labor. And at the end of the hard work and hard labor, he enjoys a rich harvest, which he and his family can enjoy, which would be a blessing for him. Uh, so in the same way, ministry is not something that is very easy. Uh, you know, it's there are challenges, there are difficulties. We need to work hard. Sometimes, you know, it's hours of hard work. Uh, you know, sometimes it can uh, be to a point where we don't have time for ourselves. Uh, you know, constantly there's so much of need. We're ministering. Of course, we need to balance out things. God gives us the wisdom to do it. Uh, but it is hard work. We just can't take things light and easy. Uh, just go and preach something that, uh, you know, uh, we just think of the hook or, you know, uh, or, you know, just think of like that and just go and share something because we have the talent of speaking, of teaching, uh, you know, or use the same sermons throughout, just teaching the same thing to, to all people who invite us. But, you know, uh, working hard, ministering um, to see how God wants us to extend the boundaries that he has uh, given to us, how we can be good stewards of the what he has placed in our hands, how we can multiply it. Remember the parables all God looks for is multiplication of investing, of getting more. Uh, so he's He's looking for how hard we have worked and how we have multiplied, how we have extended his kingdom, made it grow. And uh, so it's important. And all that does not come easy. It requires a lot of hard work, hard labor, thought process, uh, learning things, equipping ourselves, building ourselves, and, uh, you know, just doing things for to build his uh, kingdom. So these three analogies that he's giving Timothy is just 
trying to build him up and strengthen him and encouraging him um, to look at ministry with this perspective and how he can pursue his call uh, as a man of God. Any questions so far? Okay. If there are no questions, we'll move on to verses 8 to 10. So can one of you please read verses 8 to 10, please? Verse 8 to 10. Remember that Jesus Christ with the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Divya. So here he says, telling uh, Timothy, remember, which means he's reminding Timothy what he needs to keep in the forefront of his message, what he needs to preach and teach. Uh, so he's saying, you know, remember uh, that Jesus Christ is the seed of David. Uh, so this statement basically means that Jesus was fully man uh, when he came and lived on this earth. Uh, he was raised from the dead. Um, this is a great fact. You know, this is something that is a great credential of the authenticity of uh, who Jesus Christ is, uh, his, resu his resurrection from the dead. Uh, also, his resurrection from the dead means that Jesus was fully God. So when he's saying the seed of David, he's basically talking about the humanity of uh, Jesus Christ, that he was fully man. He's talking about him being raised from the dead. It's talking about, you know, our whole gospel is based on this truth that we don't believe in a, a person who is dead but is alive and living and he is alive and living now uh, because he is fully God, he's deity. Uh, so for Paul it was essential that Timothy remembers these things and teaches these truths about who uh, Jesus was and he's reminding him of all of these important core truths because there was a lot of uh, you know uh, Gnostic, Gnostic ideas that were talking uh, a lot of uh, bringing about different teachings about the deity of Jesus Christ, the humanity of Jesus Christ, and all of that. Explained that when we were studying Romans. So he, you know, uh, he uh, uh, um, always um, uh, reiterates this point that, you know, you need to preach and teach that Jesus is fully human, fully uh, uh, divine. Uh, you know, humanity and divinity, how it perfectly coexisted in the person of uh, Jesus Christ, the person and work of uh, Jesus Christ. And he says, according to my gospel, uh, of course, the gospel belonged to Paul in the sense that he preached it, but it also belonged to him in the sense that, you know, he believed it because it was so personal for him. So that's why he says, my gospel, and it was his gospel. And uh, even as it's Paul's gospel, because, you know, he preaches it, uh, he believes in it, it should also be uh, the same way we need to hold on to this gospel, say that it's my gospel, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 because we are people who have been entrusted with the gospel to uphold it, to uh, propagate it, to teach it and to protect it and guard it from false teachers and from false uh, teachings. So this is the gospel that we preach. Um, and, uh, you know, even as we hold on to this gospel, even as we have entrusted this gospel, uh, even as we are to guard this gospel and preach and teach it, you know, we must also be willing to endure hardships um, so that, you know, when we endure hardships and when we don't give away, we don't fall away because of hardships or we do not uh, go good custodians or good stewards of the truth that God has enabled to us, we start uh, you know, teaching false truths, false doctrines, then, you know, other people cannot obtain salvation or the truth, uh, you know, will uh, will not be uh, 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 taught or will not be made to others. And, you know, it can be a hindrance from others from receiving uh, salvation. So Paul is telling Timothy, you know, I'm preaching the resurrected Savior and look at me, you know, what is the result of that? I'm in chains. So I'm not just telling you, you know, that you need to endure hardships and like a soldier, like follow the rules like an athlete, you know, work hard and labor as a farmer. But look at my own life. I'm also, 
you know, uh, suffering. Uh, why am I suffering? Not because I'm, I'm an evil doer, I've done something wrong, but I am suffering, I'm in prison, I'm in chains because I'm preaching this eternal gospel, this eternal truth uh, for which I'm in chains. And I'm. he's saying I'm doing it and, you know, I'm uh, enduring all of these things so that others can receive uh, salvation. And we know that Paul in his writings he said, you know, um, uh, I'm willing to, you know, give up food, the way to, you know, uh, food or water, uh, the way of living my life so that, you know, it will not be a hindrance for others, but will be, it will benefit others uh, and not be a hindrance. The gospel will not be a hindrance, but will be helpful, will benefit others who see my life, who see my doctrine, uh, who see my way of living, that I will be an example uh, uh, also in, in deed uh, so that, you know, people will receive salvation and I will not be a hindrance in any way okay verses 11 to 13 can one of you please read that verses 11 to 13 please can yes go ahead okay so 11 to 13 um this is a faithful saying for if we died with him we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. So, you know, this is our hope uh, in the midst of, uh, you know, challenges, difficulties, persecutions, that if we die, you know, we have this hope of eternal life, which Paul has already spoken about. So, you know, he's not afraid to die. He's not being afraid. He's not afraid being in chains and uh, in prison. And he knows that he's going to die soon. But he has this glorious hope that he's going to live eternally. And then he says, if we endure hardship, you know, we are going to reign. So, you know, the whole concept of um, rewards that each one of us, you know, will face judgment, but not uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, good or bad, but in terms of reward as believers, you know, and, uh, you know, how how faithful, how committed we have been, uh, how we've endured hardships and difficulties, but we've kept going, we have persevered, uh, will you know? Uh, uh, will uh, we will receive um, uh, rewards, and that you know we will reign with him in the millennium uh, kingdom, the thousand-year rule, or when Jesus Himself will rule and reign on this earth. You know, based on how faithful, committed that we have been. You know, uh, the reward that we have received uh, will determine our position and how we will reign and what is our position, the office that we've been called to uh, enduring the millennium uh, kingdom when Jesus himself will reign on this earth. And even if we suffer now, we have this hope uh, that we will reign uh, with him. But on the other hand, you know, uh, there is consequences if we deny uh, him and the consequences is severe because he says if we deny him uh, you know uh, there is no choice for God but he will uh, deny us because Jesus said if we confess him before men he will confess us before the father in heaven so if we deny him before men then he will deny us before the father in heaven so you know our denial um, and uh, us being faithless or unfaithful will have uh, consequences. It will impact us, um, and um, and it does not change anything from uh, his is uh, from God's end. But it is something that you know we will have to reap. That's something that we will have to uh, face. Which means that you know, if any one of us had moments when we had denied the Lord, or we had gone through moments of faithlessness. Uh, when we have lost faith in God, you know, when uh, we can always get back because when we get back, we know that 
you know, God never changes. Uh, he is always good. He is always faithful. He will take us back. He will not treat us as slaves. He will treat us as his children. Uh, he will bless us. We will see his goodness. We will experience his faithfulness because he still remains faithful because he never changes. So nothing changes from God's end, but, you know, it will change on our end if we are faithless, if we are uh, if we deny him, we will experience the fail, uh, the consequences. But when we turn around, we come back, uh, we have this great assurance and hope that, you know, we serve a God who's unchanging, who's the same yesterday, today and forever. You know, he will receive us, he will love us, he will revive us, he will strengthen us. And he will take us to, uh, you know, greater levels that he has in store for us. And he will fulfill his plan and purposes uh, for us. So, you know, he stays faithful even in our ups and downs. But there is a difference between uh, denying and faithlessness. Um, you know, denying is outrightly saying no, uh, you know, saying no to his will or to his ways or to obedience to what he's called us to do or living a life of holiness. Uh, and faithless is, is when we go through moments when our faith is low and down, uh, but at those moments, God still remains uh, faithful. So God is still faithful in even when we remain faithless. He understands, you know, when our faith is slow, when our faith is uh, down, uh, he strengthens us, encourages us. But when we outrightly deny him, his word says that he will also uh, deny us. Okay. Uh, we'll just look at what question Divya has. She has a question in verse 10. It is written, for the sake of the elect, can you elaborate on that? Um, so verse 10 says, therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. So like I said, you know, elect means, uh, you know, we are the elected ones, the chosen ones, those uh, who have received salvation. Uh, they are, you know, uh, saved, they are called, they are the elected ones, the chosen ones, which does not mean that you know, we don't go to the, the whole theory of predestination where God beforehand elects or chooses certain people for salvation, search, certain people for uh, eternal hell, certain people for heaven, certain people for hell. No, it is God already knows beforehand you know who is going to choose him so those who chose him choose him receive salvation receive that call uh receive that forgiveness of sins believe in jesus christ pursue the call and the purpose of god they are called as the elect okay the elected ones chosen out ones so he's saying you know he will endure all things he will go through persecutions, difficulties, and um, trials and tribulations. He will even give up things like eating and drinking and all of those things for the sake of the believers, for the sake of the son, so that he, his life is not a hindrance uh, from preaching the gospel and from uh, people receiving salvation and um, also uh, knowing the truth that is in the gospel that has been entrusted to him. Did that help, Divya? Okay. Yes, Mangi, you have your hand up. Thank you, Pastor. Um, based on uh, just to follow up on Divya's question and the answer he gave, he, he gave us, um, is it is it right to say that uh, God, God calls everyone and He presents the gospel to everyone? So few accept, but uh, the gospel is available to everyone and every single person. Um, is given the opportunity to to hear because when we say like uh only those who are who have been that the ones that god knew that they will accept are presented the gospel sounds like they uh there is a discrimination somewhere um is it right to say that god gives call calls a god god calls everyone and only those who are who, who are destined to choose uh, God accept him. Is it right to say so? Thank you. Yes, because the word of God says that, you know, it's uh, it's good, pleasing and perfect will of God that all men come to the saving grace, the saving knowledge that is in Christ Jesus. 
Okay, that is a scripture that tells us we studied this in uh, in Romans as well. I think Romans chapter, you know, uh, in Romans chapter 15, um, uh, sorry, 11, 12, um, uh, upward, you know, 15 and uh, 14 and 15 as well, where he talks about all of these things. Uh, but like you said, um, uh, you said a statement, you know, uh, yes, God calls all of us. He wants all of us uh, to come to his saving grace and knowledge. God is not a partial God. Uh, the word uh, the scripture also says that God is not partial. He does not show partiality. We studied that in Romans as well. But you said that, you know, only those who are, um, uh, uh, you, I, I can't get the right sentence, but uh, can you repeat what you said? Uh, again, please, Mangi. Um, yep, yes, Pastor. Uh, only those who who will choose God, choose Him, accept Him, and those who who are not going to choose Him, they don't accept Him. They reject His offer. They reject uh, the Holy, the voice of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is voice. Yes, uh, you said something, uh, you said those who are predestined or uh, elected beforehand. So nobody is elected or chosen beforehand, you know, uh, to specifically, uh, uh, you know, uh, receive Jesus Christ. All of us, all of us are given the opportunity. It's God's good, perfect will and plan that all men be saved. So salvation is for everyone John 3 16 God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him so it uh, whoever believes they receive eternal life so it is not that a few are chosen or elected beforehand for salvation and a few are chosen and elected for eternal damnation no it is that all of us are given an opportunity uh, to uh, believe in the Lord Jesus, to receive salvation. But yes, like you said, you know, only those who make that choice, uh, you know, and choose and receive uh, salvation uh, will receive eternal life. And those who do not choose uh, will receive uh, eternal hell. So it's a choice that we make. It's not God choosing for us, uh, some for him and some for uh, hell because God did not create hell for us. He created hell for the devil. He created heaven for his children. He wants all of us to be in heaven with him. Uh, so there is nothing like, you know, um, God foreordained um, or pre-planned who will choose him and who will not. But he, he had the foreknowledge of, you know, uh, who will choose him and uh, who will, uh, you know, who will reject it. So he had the full knowledge, but he did not predestine or pre-plan who will choose him and who will not choose him. Did that help, Mangi? Uh, yes, first. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, we've studied this quite a bit in uh, the lectures in Romans. I remember you asking the same question as well, but it's good to uh, uh, reiterate and uh, learn, yes. Um, yes, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse uh, 19, yes. Yeah, anyone else has any questions? Any questions? Just a thought, ma'am, just a mm -hmm. you know, kind of question that it's not about choosing only, but staying with mm -hmm. him until the end is what decides the, uh, you know, final destination for, right? Yes, uh, like Hebrews chapter 6 uh, and Hebrews chapter 10 says, you know, if you look at Hebrews chapter 6, um, uh, 6 was... Um, four and six four to six so it says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heaven gift and have become partakers of the holy spirit and have tasted the good word of god and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the son of god and put him to open shame so it says very clearly here that's impossible for those who were once enlightened uh, and have tasted the heavenly gift, you know, and they fall away. Uh, same, uh, 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 you know, same book, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, uh, verse 26 and 27 says, 
But if we willfully sin, even after we have received the knowledge of the truth, then there no longer remains the forgiveness or sacrifice for sins, but certainly a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversary. So here it clearly says that we willfully sin even after we have received the knowledge of the truth, then there is no remains no longer forgiveness of sins. But we do not know which is a point. We can't judge people when they will come to that point where, you know, um, there's no longer forgiveness of sins and, you know, God is the judge. He will judge them. But yes, you know, uh, for those who have tasted the goodness of God, you know, they can even treat like these, uh, this verse says, you know, um, they can they can trample the blood of the covenant under their feet and treat it as an unworthy thing, as an unholy thing. Then there's no more forgiveness of sins left, but only a dreadful um, punishment, Hebrews chapter 10. So for those who even have received the knowledge, go away there is uh, no no more forgiveness of sins no more sacrifice for sins left that is what but we we cannot judge and say which is that sin which is that point you know it's uh, it's only god who can uh, judge yes yes christopher oh uh, yes pastor i just want to understand uh, with regards to that verse uh, if we deny him he will also deny us and mm -hmm. then the next sentence says, "If our uh, next verse says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful." So mm -hmm. I just want to understand: in one case he de denies us, but in the other case he remains faithful. So I just started, wanted to try and understand what is the difference between denying him and being faithless. Uh, because in one case it is, you know, he remains, he denies us, but in the other case, you know, he remains faithful. I just wanted to understand that. Yes, good question. Um, so denying is basically outrightly saying no, rejecting God's will for your life, living in uh, total obedience, total submission, even deny, saying no to his ways, his uh, his purpose, uh, even saying no to salvation or going away from uh, the truth that we have received the salvation. So like, you know, Paul is uh, mentioning so many of them who have shipwrecked their faith, they've gone away from their uh, faith. So totally when we deny God, he will deny us. Uh, but when he's talking about uh, faith, you know, being faithless, uh, there are times when God knows our faith is slow, you know, our faith is down. It's not that we are denying him. That's not that we are not putting our trust of faith in him or denying that that he is God, that he does not exist or, or you know, we've gone away from the truth or, you know, the doctrines or all of that. But we just don't have that faith because we're depressed, we're, you know, we're broken with the, what we are going through in our situations. Our faith is slow, and he he knows that he understands our frailties. He understands our weaknesses, like we read in Hebrew. Uh, you know, he's a high priest who sympathizes with us, who, who understands us, uh, and and those times he remains faithful. You know, he still remains good. He's still uh, the son. But when when we deny him outright, he's saying no to, uh, you know. Uh, to work uh, to his obedience to his will to his purpose in our life uh, that time you know he will also deny us did that help uh, christopher yes thank you okay yes mangi uh thank you pastor um just to, to add to that example mm -hmm. example of that came, came to mind it's uh, Israelites from in the desert where they had a chance to cross into the, the promised land, but they refused. They, they doubted and then God still kept them for 40 years in the desert, giving them manna, giving them food, giving them, uh, keeping them healthy, even though they were not walking in the will of God, but God remained uh, faithful. He kept them while they refused to to, to, to walk in his will. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, we can say that, you know, uh, some of them were grumbling and complaining and murmuring, but yes, they received the punishment of God, the wrath of God. Uh, but God was still faithful to the promise that he made to the forefathers um, and also was faithful to those like uh, Joshua and Caleb who, you know, um, uh, who believe that, you know, God can give them the promised land. And so for the few uh, select elect people, you know, he he continued to 
hold on to his faithfulness and his uh, promise but those who rejected him yes they they uh, you know could not taste uh, or experience his um, uh, or uh, or see the blessing or live in that blessing yes uh, so mangi coming back to your uh, initial question about god's choosing and election you know what we studied in romans chapter 9 and verse 10 so you can uh, read that romans chapter uh, verses 9 and 10 you can listen back to the lectures it can help you um uh, but he says paul says in romans chapter 10 verse 13 whoever calls on the name of the lord shall be saved so you know and also he mentions that there is no partiality with god but Basically, Romans chapter 9 and verse 10 uh, can help you understand better. You can listen also to the lectures. Okay, uh, we'll stop here. Uh, we've way past six minutes of our time. Thank you all for joining class. Uh, we'll continue with, um, uh, with this in the next class. Thank you, everybody. Have a good um, uh, day and a good week ahead. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Rupa.